I'm uh, delighted to be able to introduce Gene Spafford today uh, to talk about the worm. Uh, he's been, uh, well, Gene and I go back a long way. We met at Georgia Tech back when he was a student and I was an assistant professor there. He uh, wrote the kernel to the cloud's distributed operating system and is presently editing a book on it. Uh, actually, though, now he's working in software engineering on the Mothra project at Purdue, which is a uh, software engineering project uh, focusing on methods of testing. And uh, he's, at this moment, probably much better known for the technical report that's been distributed around here and for his uh, mention in the New York Times, if you've uh, seen that, and appearance on uh, NPR. He's been characterized as an international com uh, computer security expert, but uh, characterizes himself as an international computer security risk. and. Uh, <laughs> and victim of media hype. Uh, so uh, I'll give you Gene Spafford. Oh, and I hope, Gene, you're going to answer the question of uh, was the worm alive in your talk? Maybe. My talk today is entitled uh, Worms, Viruses, and Other Program Pests. And this appears to be a topic of some interest, judging from, from the crowd. I am going to talk really about security as a general topic um, and some issues related to it. I'm going to focus a little bit on some of the activity, some of the, some of the effects of the Internet Worm program. I'm not going to delve into that in a great deal because, uh, as Nancy said, the technical report I wrote, which seems to have circulated quite widely, uh, <laughs> describes in a fair amount of detail how that behaved. And I'm not going to repeat that information. I'm going to talk about some other things. I'm certainly willing to answer questions that you may have that, that I'll try to answer uh, on that program or, or about related issues. One of the reasons I want to talk about security in a little bit more general sense is although the Internet Worm program caused considerable attention from the media and from the computer science community, it's not the only such incident. Uh, within the last 30 days, there have been five or six other major break-ins at uh, sites around the country, including uh, a recent week-long uh, episode at Lawrence Livermore Labs. Uh, there have been break-ins at the MITRE Corporation, which caused the MILNET to be separated from the ARPANET for a period of about four days while I attempted to track that down. Uh, the Digital Equipment Corporation had to shut down their internal network for a weekend due to some break-ins, and a number of other incidents. Whether or not those have been inspired uh, by the Internet Worm program or whether the media has just covered these incidents a little bit more closely uh, because of the original publicity is hard to say. But security is a problem right now. It's, it's something that a lot of people are interested in. What I'm going to talk about today First, I'm going to say a little bit about what is security in a general sense, without trying to give you a formal definition, but to give you some idea of what's involved. Um, how do we go about securing our, our machines to prevent people from getting into them, prevent programs from getting into them? Some of the kinds of threats that we face, we have to consider. I'll talk a little bit about the Internet worm and some of its implications and how it behaved. And then two other things, legal approaches. What do we do from a legal standpoint to deal with these kind of problems? And what I think are some ethical and professional <coughs> considerations that we need to have in mind. I have here, what is security? Well, in a very general sense, Security as it applies to a computing environment first is protection against denial of service and degradation of service. That we have a computing resource we want to have access to. We'd like to protect that so that no one can get in and prevent us from using the machine, prevent us from using the services, or to degrade them in such a way that they're no longer attractive to use. 
assuming they were attractive to use in the first place. <laughs> we like to protect against data loss and alteration. The material that we have online, the data we've collected, whatever it may be, our programs, our phone lists, uh, corporate data records, we like to protect those so that people can't get in and um, alter them in any way or destroy them and possibly um, put us out of business, uh, depending on what that data may be. We want to ensure some consistency of interaction, that we'd like the machine to behave the same way every time we use it. And that means that the compiler should still compile. It should still be present. When we get on and we attempt to use the editor, it shouldn't delete our files when we start running it. Now, that kind of security is not simply uh, securing against outside threat. That may also be securing against some of our local system administration who've got a new version they want to install. Uh, it could be, uh, in a sense, securing against errors in the software. But that is a kind of security that we want to ensure. And the last is ensuring confidentiality of our data, which is a lot different than simply protecting it against loss. We want to protect it against disclosure. We may have information that would give someone else an advantage were they be able to uh, read it in some way. And we want to be sure that they can't get at it. Part of this process is, is risk assessment. What happens if we do lose our access or our data? Is it catastrophic or not? And I think I kind of like this little cartoon. Um, sort of gets across the point of why is it important that we do protect our data. We could end up losing everything that we need to do our job and end up with something that we really don't want. Read it out loud. It says, <laughs> now don't panic. Not everything was erased. We still have loads of data on rainfall, upholstery, and jaywalking. <laughs> okay, how do, how do you achieve security? Well, it comes about by inhibiting sharing, by inhibiting trust. And basically powering off your computer, casting it in concrete, putting it in a lead line room with armed guards on it, and you're close to secure. You still can't depend on those guards and uh, somebody not picking the locks. Another way of saying that is safe computing means not doing any. Yeah, just say no to computing. <laughs> and that's, that's really true. There's, there's no such thing as a completely secure system. All that you're doing is you're limiting your risk. You're trying as best as possible to make it difficult or, in some sense, uh, not economical for somebody to compromise your system or um, steal your data or take your system down. So you're trying to limit risk. You're trying to balance how important is it to you that your system is protected and how much are you willing to spend to put that protection in? Are you willing to go that, that extra mile to um, really bulletproof the software and put in the extra guards? Now, there are three parts to this risk reduction. And only one of them is, is traditionally thought of as computer security by, by people who don't work in that area. And that is simply securing the software, securing the computer, making it more difficult for somebody to uh, affect the computer in some way. However, there are really two other aspects of securing your system. One is to increase the cost associated with discovering somebody tampering with your system. That is the legal cost. Make it riskier for someone to tamper with your system because it's going to be more than simply an expenditure of time and effort on their part. They may end up having to expend a significant amount of money or possibly even serving time of some sort. A third is to increase social awareness of the problem. Bring a social pressure to bear. If it's seen as attractive to break into systems, then lots of people will try and do that will be seen as, an, as an, a socially accepted method of, of something. I don't know what, but uh, sort of a rite of passage, Sim such as uh, it's currently seen in some places to be a rite of passage to go in and steal something or to mug someone. Uh, and that tends to increase that behavior. 
What we need to do is the opposite, create a social awareness that it's not a good idea to break into other people's systems to damage their, their property. Working on all three of these areas is going to be better than any single one. All three together probably are not going to be sufficient as a, well, shall I say cure, but they're all important in the process. First of those, the idea of securing a system. I've got nine general principles here. Uh, not everyone would agree with this list, but I think these are important. If you're going to be developing software and you want to try and protect that software, if you want to try and protect your computer system uh, against damage, loss, alteration. First, you need to verify the identity of actors. That is, anyone who's got access to your machine who does anything, you need to verify their identity. And verifying identity may mean a lot more than simply verifying a login. It's knowing who is actually using your system. If you take this to extremes, it means that you've got some kind of physical controls with a logbook, an ID card or something, before someone can get in and use a terminal to access a system. That's at the extreme side. Uh, you can enforce the principle of least privilege, which is you only give users access to the bare minimum necessary to do what they need to do to accomplish their tasks, their jobs. You don't give them access to extra uh, compilers or libraries or files. Uh, you don't give them access to the games. Keep them to the bare, bare necessities. Third, track activity. You keep a log of what people are doing. And if you see some kind of anomalous behavior, people are trying to access files that they shouldn't be getting access to, or they're trying to run commands with weird arguments, you should act on it. You should find out why. Fourth, verify the correct behavior of software and protocols. Make sure that what you think you've got there actually behaves the way it's supposed to. Make sure that it is adhering to all the necessary protocols. Make sure the software doesn't have any funny bugs in it. Five, expect the unexpected, which is have some plans in place for things that you don't really expect are ever going to happen, but just in case they are, you want to have some kind of contingency. You want to know what to do about it. Six, be paranoid. For those of you who run a system, or for those of you who use your own workstation, if you try to log in and you get some kind of weird message like can't open file in temp, instead of simply saying, hmm, the login program must be broken, you should be a little bit paranoid and say, I wonder if somebody's planted a, a Trojan horse login here that's captured my password. You should look for those kinds of things. You should be a little bit paranoid when these kinds of uh, occurrences happen. Seventh. Keep copies. One of the risks of people breaking into your system are if they damage your data or destroy it altogether. By you keeping copies, you can do a comparison if you suspect anything. Or if you lose it, you can restore it. In the case of the internet worm, for instance, a big concern of a lot of people when it hit was, is this destroying my data? Is this altering my data? Is this changing my programs in some way? A lot of us really didn't worry about that because we had everything on tape. You know, we do daily backups or twice daily backups because we're, we're uh, conscious of the effect that might, uh, uh, what might happen in case our data disappeared. For those people who don't back up your systems, maybe once every week or every two weeks, that kind of uh, behavior is catastrophic because if you lose your disk, well, you're out that couple weeks' work. Eighth, physical protection is just as important, if not more so, than the logical protection I was just talking about. Uh, I know of an awful lot of installations which take great pride and they've got a computer security expert who's gone over all the software. They do daily backups. And they keep their computer in a room behind a nice piece of plate glass. And all somebody has to do is throw a brick through the plate glass and throw in a Molotov cocktail and that's it. They keep all their backup tapes in the same room. That's it for the machine, the data, everything. Physical security is very important. For those of you with a workstation, you may have the best passwords anybody could ever have on that system. You've got all the programs tightened up. Nobody can break in over the Ethernet. But they walk into your office while you're at lunch and reboot the machine single user, and they've got full access to everything on your system. So physical security is very, very important and is often overlooked. And ninth, a principle of security is dedicate resources for really important applications. If you've got a database, that is very, very important, that's very secure, maybe payroll database, and you don't want any chance of anybody getting to it, you dedicate a room with a special lock on it, and you put a machine in there that isn't on the network. 
you go to a little extra effort to put it in a secured location and when people need to access it they have to go through a little bit of extra effort uh, use a little extra in resources to go directly to where it is and use it but instead of putting it on a shared machine where anybody can possibly break some software and get to it okay so how does that affect our favorite operating system here Unix well at least I assume it's the favorite operating system I think a lot of you use it maybe that means it's not your favorite I'm not sure but Unix is particularly vulnerable when you compare it against this list of of uh, guidelines I just went over. Processes can set their user ID. You can log in with your login ID and then run programs to somebody else. And there's no way to verify that. There's no way to tell for sure who it is that's actually running those programs. You can spoof Unix, you can come in remotely as another user and there's no way to tell who it is that's actually using the system. Excess privilege abounds. Generally the way these systems are set up, everybody's got access to source code, Everybody's got access to all these files, the libraries, the compilers. Uh, you've got access, you can read the password file, you can read the accounting information. So you can see basically anything that's there. An awful lot more than what you need to do in your day-to-day -day tasks. Logging is minimal and easily circumvented. That all the information that's normally kept as to who accesses and what you do uh, is often shut off because it's a pain. Whoever's running the system, you've got to worry about these files getting too large and clogging up your disk. And you never look at that information anyhow, so why bother? Uh, systems are loosely administered. Well, that's part of it. Uh, if everybody's got a Sun workstation on their, on their desk and you've got a few hundreds or thousands of them here, uh, all these machines, it's very difficult for a, a system staff, no matter how large they are, to maintain and watch all those systems. And in general, because it's a trusted environment, you don't bother. Software testing is not a well-developed science. And I can speak from experience there because that's an area I work in. That when a program is developed, especially a complex program, it's very difficult to say whether or not that program is going to behave correctly, whether it does all the things you want it to do. So being sure that there are no flaws in the software is, is difficult. And it's especially difficult in the Unix environment because uh, there are a lot of tools for building programs, but not very many tools for testing them. Almost all writes possible from any physical location. The way Unix is built, there is nothing tied to a physical terminal. That is, there are no special privileges associated with the console, with the hardware. If, you're, if you have the proper software privileges from any point on the, on the logical network or, or logged in across the network, then you can do anything you want to the system. You can alter the disks, you can read or write from the console, you can do all kinds of things. There's no special privilege associated. Uh, with the system. So as pretty much any user coming in, you can, you can access all kinds of things that normally you shouldn't be able to. All the resources on the system are available and shared, which is basically a, another way of stating the same thing, that everybody can get to all the disks, the tape drives, and, and so on. Foreign software is easily installed. That is, things that you didn't write, you didn't check yourself, one of your users can bring in plop it into the system and use it. It's especially true of things you can bring in across the network. You can, you can unpack uh, uh, files, compile the programs and run them and you have no idea what's in them. And your users who may not have a good understanding of how the programs are supposed to work, they may not even understand how, program, how programs are built in the Unix environment, can pull in files from anywhere they've heard advertised, not even look at it, just run the commands and they've got a program that's there and they run it. And commands can be altered. The commands aren't built into the operating system itself. They're separate programs. So you can go in and you can install a new login program. This is what was done at Lawrence Livermore. People broke into uh, Lawrence Livermore uh, Labs computers as root and proceeded to build new versions of login and telnet and a whole bunch of other utilities that had trap doors built into them so that they could issue their own passwords and become the super user anytime they logged in. And the people at uh, Lawrence Livermore are still trying to find all the programs that have been altered that way. Everything I've gone through is exactly why Unix is so widely used and appreciated. It's incredibly flexible. You can share almost anything. You can port software from machine to machine. You can reconfigure the machine for your special projects easily without having to call in a whole staff of people who've been trained to do it. You can sit down yourself and in a very short amount of time 
have an entirely different machine environment to work in. So this is kind of an illustration of the basic conflict that I was just talking about. You have sharing or you can have security. It's very difficult to have, have any amount of both. I have a list here of uh, kinds of internal threats, things that you have to worry about. I'm going to go through really quickly. Idea of logic bombs. Logic bombs are programs or program segments uh, that are built into standard software and just wait for the right condition. When the right condition occurs, they go off doing whatever it is they're designed to do. The uh, one I liked best was the fellow who worked for a company as their systems programmer. And uh, he liked to spend a lot of time writing and playing computer games. He was very good as a systems programmer, systems administrator, and usually finished up everything he had to do by noon every day. And rather than spend the rest of the day just kind of sitting around and watching the lights, he would write these games. Well, management didn't think it was appropriate for him to be writing games on their time and warned him a couple times and finally fired him. Two months after they fired him, everything on the machine disappeared. The disk just went clean. It seems that he had written a... Uh, little change into the disk driver routine on the, on the system that it would check the payroll every month and if his social security number didn't appear for two months running it wiped everything. <laughs> Another kind of internal threat, covert channels. Um, information getting passed along to someone that, that you don't, in a way you don't realize. Uh, a real good example of a covert channel in, in uh, Unix is the fact you have this shared temp directory, and when you go to edit a file or you go to sort something, it puts temporaries out in the temp directory. And very often those temporary files have world readable, world writable uh, protection. So anybody who's waiting around and knows you're doing some long job can just snarf a copy of those files and take a look at them. And it's a channel that you didn't intend, uh, but they're able to take advantage of. Back doors. I mentioned one in, con in conjunction with the login program. Somebody builds something in so that they can break into the machine uh, and take advantage of, of the program. You install software, system software developed by somebody else you haven't looked at carefully, and there's very often a chance that uh, there's a backdoor in it. The SendMail program, the bug that was exploited by the worm program, had a backdoor in it. It was written in on purpose. The fellow who developed the program, uh, when he originally distributed the program, wasn't able to debug it on every site because not, not every site admin would give him the super user password. So he built in code to the program that would allow him to execute commands remotely as the super user by just invoking the right combination of things in the mailer program. Not all of those capabilities got taken out for the release and that was one of the, uh, one of the things exploited by the worm program. Cracking, people trying to guess or break your passwords locally. Overload, if you overload the machine, uh, sufficiently. That's a threat to security because that uh, security as I defined it because it, it can uh, make your machine unusable. Um, for those of you who use Unix uh, much, a really good example of overloading your machine is while true fork. <laughs> for those of you who don't use Unix and understand what that means, it basically means exponential growth of processes very quickly and eventually your machine just fills up uh, with so many processes and creating new processes that nothing else can be done. The only, the only cure to that is to, to reboot the machine. Uh, don't try that at home. Uh, <laughs> there's a threat to security is accident. <clears throat> if uh, a common cause of accidents, <laughs> yeah, running with a loaded computer, um, <clears throat> is doing things as a privileged user that you really don't need to be doing as a privileged user. Uh, for instance, if you're cleaning up directories and you're doing it as root and you don't need to, you aren't, you aren't careful. Uh, how many people have ever typed rm star space dot o? <laughs> that, that's an example of accident. And if you do that as a privileged user, you've really got problems. Carelessness? Well, maybe carelessness is the same as accident, maybe not. Stupidity? That's probably not a problem here. But uh, there are an awful lot of sites where that is the case. Um, a good example that I have heard, VMS is shipped with a system account for management. And the password is manager. 
So you can log in the system with Password Manager. And uh, most people who get these systems never bother to change the password. So if you, know, if you ever have access to a VMS system, you might see if Manager works as the password for that, for that account. Odds are it usually does. Vandalism. Internal threats is somebody who has access to the machine and just wants to cause trouble, uh, either physically or logically. Uh, bacteria and Trojan horses I'll talk about in uh, another minute or two. External threats. Cracking again, people trying to break into accounts, crack passwords. Overload can also be done externally. Um, the alleged author of the Internet worm, Robert Morris, um, usually say Junior. Uh, his name is not actually Robert Morris Jr. It's Robert T. Morris. His father is Robert Morris, no middle initial. So uh, that, that's something that was wrong in most of the newspapers. But the alleged author of, of the virus, um, when he was working at Bell Labs, wrote a technical report on how to spoof TCP IP, which is the protocol used to communicate with the various systems, uh, through overload by throwing too many packets at, at the system. And as a result, you could, you could fool it into thinking that uh, you were a different user and gain access that way. Uh, it's a rather interesting little report. <laughs> Physical threats from outside. Somebody doesn't have access to an account on the machine, but can get to the machine. Uh, I classify under this category also the possibility of people tapping phone lines or tapping terminal lines or putting an Ethernet monitor on. Uh, those of you who think you've got some kind of security because you've got really good passwords, anybody sharing the same Ethernet can put a PC with a very cheap bit of software and hardware on it and monitor everything that goes across that Ethernet, including your password when you type it to get in. Uh, in terms of security there, you've got to physically secure the medium as well. Worms, Trojan horses, and viruses, again, I'll talk about a little bit more in just a minute. In fact, I'll talk about them right now. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about four kinds of what I consider program beasts. I've um, been told that we kind of stretch this analogy a little far. Uh, for lack of a better analogy, might as well stretch it and see how far it'll go. The idea of a computer virus, to the best of my knowledge, was first described in a science fiction uh, book, which I always enjoyed, called When Harley Was One. For those of you who go out to look for the book, there's a new edition that's just recently been printed, and it omits all mention of virus. I bet the publishers are really kicking themselves over this. <laughs> but uh, in the book, there was an artificial intelligence that they were attempting to teach about ethics, what was right and what was wrong. And one of the examples was a case where a scientist had written a program uh, called Virus, which would go out and infect machines and overload them, and cause them to call other computers and infect them with virus and so on. And then the scientist introduced uh, a little program called Vaccine, which if it was put on a machine with virus, would cure virus. Uh, and he was going to make a lot of money off of selling Vaccine, claiming that he had actually invented virus, uh, but that wasn't generally known. He was just going to claim to invent Vaccine and make money off of it. And then noise on a phone line mutated virus so Vaccine didn't work. Uh, it was a very interesting, interesting story. Then, uh, in 1983, Fred Cohen, then a grad student at USC, uh, developed the first real virus that he, he wrote and tested in that seminar um, as part of a project. Uh, the name virus was suggested by his, his advisor, uh, who he credited uh, in his thesis. And the first one was run on November 3rd, 1983, which, interestingly enough, is almost the, the date that the Internet worm was set loose uh, one day prior. Um, assuming that the author of the worm uh, was as good with a calendar as he was with his coding, um, it, it may be similar to uh, Pearl Harbor Day and George Bush. Um. <laughs> okay, I characterize a virus by the lack of ability to run independently or spread itself to other machines. Viruses usually occur on PCs. Very seldom see them uh, on larger multi-user machines that have things like memory protection and process protection. There are a lot of instances of viruses. They become a, a true epidemic problem with PCs, 
Uh, I mentioned a couple here. Uh, Mac Peace Virus, which was written by some publishers in Canada. They, it was harmless. They just wanted it to go out and um, print a message of world peace on everybody's Macintosh on March 3rd. Interestingly enough, it somehow found its way into some commercial software distributions. Uh, the Aldis uh, Corporation had to recall something like 25,000 copies of their freehand program because it had been infected by this virus. The May 13th Hebrew University virus was kind of interesting. Uh, it's not entirely sure who programmed it, but um, I don't know the exact details. Uh, May 13th is, was the anniversary of something to do with the uh, uh, founding of the Palestinian state, uh, 50th anniversary in 1938. And this virus was in PCs at Hebrew University and a number of other universities in Israel and was intended to wipe the disks on uh, May 13th. That was found and, and negated before it had a chance to do that. The Pakistani Brothers virus is one that's been well publicized. I'm not going to talk about it. The last one is interesting to me. Uh, Tom Duff um, at uh, Bell Labs has developed a virus, did develop a, a virus that runs under Unix. And uh, he wrote about it. The paper is going to appear in the Winter Usenix Conference in San Diego uh, in February. And it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, it got away from him, in fact, and they had to shut down some machines while he cleaned it off. Uh, it's a fascinating paper. And for those of you who are going to Usenix, I think you'll appreciate it. And for those of you who are not, you can probably get a copy from him or a copy of the uh, proceedings. Worms. First occur. Again, in science fiction, as far as I can tell from anywhere, uh, they were called tapeworms. And they appeared in The Shockwave Writer by John Brunner, uh, a very interesting book. Uh, some, of, um, some or maybe many of you have read. <coughs> the first write-up of worm programs was done in 1982 uh, by some folks at Xerox Park who had developed worm programs from about 1979 to 1982. And they credited. Uh, the shockwave writer is the source of, of the name. Worm programs were intended to go through their distributed system from workstation to workstation and, uh, and do computation. Uh, they were to take idle workstations and make use of them to do things or to go around and power uh, workstations down. You know, it was under software control. These were ELTOs. Uh, to go workstation to workstation and power them down uh, if they'd been idle for any certain amount of time or reboot systems that had gotten hung in some way. Uh, so they were very useful. However, there were one or two versions that got away from them and that they weren't able to, to, to stop easily. Um, so it was early on, it was recognized this was something that could cause difficulty. Characterized by their ability to uh, reproduce themselves and run without attaching to any programs, spreading from machine to machine. And they're not easy to make. That's why we haven't seen many of them. Uh, the IBM VNet problem that many of you may have read about that also made the news about a year ago was a look like a Christmas card electronically. But when you got this Christmas card and displayed it, it proceeded to send copies of itself to everybody that was listed in your mail file. And quickly, the network just clogged with um, literally hundreds of thousands of copies of this thing being mailed back and forth from site to site. And they had to shut down the network uh, while they cleaned it out of all the systems. And then there's the, the uh, internet worm that was released November 3rd that I think we've all had more experience with than we like. Bacteria, sort of an old concept, a new term. Uh, Peter Denning used this term in earlier this year in a copy of um, American Scientist uh, in his column. And basically, it's a program that can reproduce itself. Uh, it loads the local system down just consumes resources, doesn't spread to other systems. And the example of while one fork, that's a bacteria or a bacterium. Uh, I'm not sure I like this, this name, but uh, uh, it's been used in the literature uh, at, least, at least twice now. So uh, uh, I throw it up here for completeness' sake. There's the. Uh, Trojan horse, sort of an old concept and an old name. It's a program that does something you don't expect. You think you're running an editor or a spreadsheet, and meanwhile, it's deleting all your files. Um, many examples. Uh, my favorite, and, and an article that I think everybody should read, if, if you have any interest at all, 
in anything to do with computer security is Ken Thompson's Turing Award uh, address. It was in, I don't remember which month. Anybody know which month? 83? Well, you can read the whole year's worth. Uh, on trusting trust. And basically he points out that you can't have a system that you trust completely. Some, I mean, that, that you know is correct from the hardware level on up. At some point, you've got to trust that system. You've got to put your trust in its correctness and, and in its proper behavior. Um, another example that was circulated about a year ago in one of the sources group on Usenet, somebody had a shar file for a program that everybody thought was going to be really exciting. And uh, turned out it had a, uh, an RM command buried in the shar file. So if you tried to unshard the software, it would just go along, pull off a couple files, and then proceed to delete everything in your account, print boom, and then pull off another two files. So you'd end up at your home directory would have nothing except for two files in it. And a little cartoon that uh, I ran across while I was putting the slides together, and I thought it was kind of interesting. It says, open the gate, it's a big wiener dog. authors of, of these types of things. Who is it that writes these programs? I mean, they're not, they're not trivial. Who would go about writing these and setting them loose? Well, saboteurs. That may seem silly to you in some sense, but corporate sabotage is something that happens quite a lot. And it hasn't really hit the computer realm to a great deal yet that we know of, but it's certainly there as a possibility. One of my first thoughts when I saw the, the worm program come across, since it only affected sons and, and DEC equipment, VAXs, uh, wouldn't that be a very interesting act of sabotage against, say, Sun? Just think. Here, it's shown to everyone how poor their security on their software was, supposedly. But everybody who had a Sun, their machines were suddenly, geez, we've got these problems in, in the software. Now, if the author of this software was, in fact, a saboteur and had knowledge of another hole that he knew or she knew, or they knew, was going to remain uh, unplugged, another two, three months later, they set another one of these things loose. Now, if you had a son, or you were considering buying it, and twice in the space of a couple months, your system went down, it was infected from outside, you had all these problems, would you seriously consider buying any more? It would be a very effective act of sabotage. And not just, it doesn't have to be limited to just son, but almost any other manufacturer. Um, if it was an attempt to sabotage, maybe the VMS group at Digital did it. <laughs> right? If you think about it, those kind of motives are possible. And they could fit in with any of these other programs. Thieves are embezzlers. Well, this is another thing I think that, that isn't stretching the imagination too far. There's a lot of data online on systems that somebody could have... Uh, decided that they wanted copies of. A, real, a really uh, common use of these kinds of programs where you destroy a system is to hide evidence. You've embezzled company funds and now you want to lose all the data. Oops, it's all gone, sorry. And if somehow they've managed to get taken care of the uh, backup tapes as well so that there is no evidence except what's online and you can say, geez, the program got it. Another one of the things I, that occurred to me at first is wouldn't this be a great masking mechanism? Set off this benign, or mostly benign, program that would infect machines all around the country, then take a very carefully engineered version that was similar, but maybe did something. It altered programs or it altered, da altered data files, and let it loose on just a couple machines. Now, maybe only Citicorp's machines had this particular version of the worm program. National coverage, everybody says, geez, we know it was benign. Here's the structure of it. We've got reports out. We've got papers. Everybody knows what it was. They never bother to check their system. How do you know? Who compares all the, all the versions? Vandals. Why do vandals do anything? You know, why, do they, why do they spray paint cars? Why do they throw bricks through windows? Because it's there, I guess. That certainly happens in the computer realm. Immature crackers. Um, I, I try not to use the word hackers here, uh, although it's, it's getting nigh impossible to, to use that term in a nice way. But 
there have been some psychological studies done of the kind of individual who takes great pride in finding ins and outs in, on machines. And the ones who are generally teenage, uh, that age group, or college students who break into systems, have been found to fit, by and large, the same kind of profile. They are immature. They do not relate well with other people. And in fact, they are frustrated in their relationships with other people. They find it very difficult to get people uh, to say the right things, to get people to do what they want them to do. So they retreat to the computer because the computer will do what they want them to do if only they phrase it correctly. If they work very hard, they can understand it completely and it will perform exactly as they want it to perform. And it's reinforcing behavior. Because they get more involved with the computer and they learn to master it better, it does what they want. Because they spend so much time with the computer, they don't polish their social skills at all. And in fact, other people begin to call them nerds or whatever. Um, that whatever, yeah. Uh, and as a result, it reinforces that kind of behavior. Those individuals um, have to find new challenges. And so they, they work on bigger and bigger problems or bigger and bigger machines. It is more important to them to try and master something more complex. Okay, so, some, some motives. Profit, I mentioned. Uh, revenge. Somebody's fired from Belcor for something that they feel they don't deserve. If they've got access into the machines, just think of what they might be able to do. Um, and how would you trace it if they knew how to do it right? Uh, sense of power and control, I mentioned that. Camouflage, uh, again, I gave an example of that. Boredom, I don't think that's a very good excuse, but that's used sometimes. Curiosity, see if it could be done. And I spelled that wrong. Um, one. Uh, one thing I didn't put up there that, that occurred to me as I was going over the slides last night, um, I'll, I'll relate. Uh, when I was a grad student at Georgia Tech, uh, I spent a lot of time. I, I, I knew the machines really well, and I was kind of one of the people on call in case the machines had problems. And uh, there was a time not long after I arrived that uh, uh, they hired a new operator to do the backups at night, and I thought she was kind of cute. And uh, so every once in a while, the machine would crash while she was doing backups. And uh, it would happen to crash on the night when the system staff were playing basketball and I was the only one available to call on. <laughs> Unfortunately, she learned how to bring the machine up on her, on her own and that ended that. <laughs> <clears throat> Let me kind of go through how the worm established itself on machines and some of the, some of the security principles that, if they'd been applied, could have stopped it uh, and, and sort of what the implications are. First, the worm would introduce itself through the send mail or finger D, daemon programs, programs that are running in the background. It would connect to them. It would uh, utilize the debug command on send mail. It would overflow a buffer on the, on the finger D program. Uh, it would basically take advantage of flaws in either the protocol or the software of those programs. That the finger D program had never been really debugged carefully. No one had ever tried to throw 600 characters worth of input at it to see what would happen. So that was kind of faulty programming there. The problem with SendMail is it had this debug option and it was installed everywhere. The program hadn't ever really been debugged carefully. Nobody had ever spent the time to try and make it completely robust. And, and so you didn't need the debug option. So the worm would get in through there, establish itself in the temporary directory, establish a helper program to, to uh, bring itself across. So it would establish itself in the user temp directory. Now there is a problem. You've got a directory that everybody can read and write into. Uh, a lot of systems, you have a concept of temporary storage, but it's per user. You don't have some central pool that everybody can get into and everybody can get out of. But each user account has their own temporary space. There's some question as to why why does a mailer program need access to that temp directory? And in fact, why does the mailer program need access to be able to run the C compiler? Uh, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The, the principle of least privilege here would have said that uh, those kind of commands, that kind of access wouldn't be available to service programs. But in the Unix system, any process that can name it has access to it. Those things can be run by any process anywhere. 
Third, the worm gathered information about hosts, networks, and users. It ran a program to find out what networks uh, the current computer interface to, get information about hosts, connectivity. It would read through user files to find out where users had accounts on other machines. And it would build a list of hosts and information about those hosts that it would then try uh, to break into. <coughs> Again, something running under the user ID of the mail program, why does it need to find out what networks the machine's connected to? That's not part of delivery of mail. Uh, the fact that you can read all this information in users' home files is another question. Why is that information publicly available? The answer to that, again, is trust. When we're working in an academic or a research environment and we've got our systems configured, we tend to trust everybody else in that environment who has access to that machine. You wouldn't think of anybody within Belcor, for instance, who might break into your machine and cause damage. But you've got to realize that if your machine's sitting on that Ethernet, then it isn't just Belcor, but it's universities and other industries and competitors all around the country who potentially can get into your machine, even if it's indirectly. So you have to reevaluate your concept of trust here, and we may have to do that within the system itself and enforce a different level. Fourth, the worm attacked remote hosts using either the FingerD attack, uh, the SendMail attack, or the, or the RExec mechanism. Uh, this is something that we had a lot of problems with when we were trying to stop it because we didn't know what it was doing. It didn't log any of this information. There was nothing held that said uh, somebody tried to connect to your RExec port with the wrong password or some process tried to deliver uh, funny mail and it didn't work. There was no information logged. We had no idea how, how to take action. And again, um, having one of these daemon programs attempting to, um, uh, why do you have a background daemon trying to find out information about a user who's online? That, that, that's a problem in the, in the whole mechanism. Fifth, Worm tried to break passwords and collect information from, from forward files. A lot has been said and written about the password mechanism under Unix. Uh, and I'm not going to say a lot here, uh, um, except that the problem is anybody can read the password file. You can read the encrypted contents of that password file. You can either take a library routine or write your own, because you can get access to the source code, and write a program to try and break passwords. And there's absolutely no record that you're doing it. In fact, you can get a copy of the password file off and take it over to, uh, I don't know, an Alliant, a Cray, a Sequent, and run some really highly parallelized or vectorized program to break the passwords. And the people whose machine you're breaking into don't even know it. Uh, a solution here is not to make that file readable, is not to make it available. Of course, it's also a good idea to make very difficult passwords so that uh, they have to use a brute force approach. Even with a brute force approach, if you had a couple, couple uh, Cray class machines running in parallel, would take uh, dozens of years to try all the possible combinations. So uh, the mechanism itself is fairly secure, but what we do with the encrypted information is, is not very secure. And sixth, the worm would try to break into user accounts by taking these passwords, by taking information from the info files, taking it from uh, the forward files, and try to break into accounts on other machines. Here's the problem of verifying users. Who is it that's really trying to use my machine? We don't have a good mechanism there uh, in, in the Unix environment to do that. We trust other systems. If the system comes across and says that, that that's user uh, root or that's user LPD or user mail, we believe it because we sort of trust the mechanisms in that <coughs> system. Okay, that's, that's what I'm going to talk about in terms of uh, programmed means for security. I want to say a few words about legal means. This is something that I was discussing at lunch uh, with a few people. You might argue that in our society we have two purposes to, uh, to laws and to punishment. First is deterrence. We want to keep people from, keep other people from doing the same thing. We want to get across the message that if you violate the law, if you do this unacceptable behavior, you will be punished. Uh, whether or not that actually is what happens uh, is another matter entirely, but that's the message intended to get across. Now that can be argued, uh, but, but that seems to be one of, the, one of the clear motives. A second is rehabilitation. 
that whoever did this criminal act, we would like to rehabilitate them in some sense, make them aware of what they did that was wrong, uh, and not have them do it again. We'd like to get them back in as a productive member of society. Uh, if uh, Robert Morris, uh, in fact, was the author of, of this program, uh, he shows some potential. Uh, I, I have looked at the reverse engineered code. It's not great. He made an awful lot of mistakes. And uh, as if you've read in the, in the technical report, uh, there were some poor choices of, of algorithms and a lot of bugs. Does certainly understand networking code, though, uh, very well. And there are reports that he has some concepts of uh, holes in system security because he's broken into systems in a number of different, different locations prior to this incident. Uh, that kind of knowledge may be very useful. He may be uh, a contributing member of the profession at some point, but he's got to learn if, in fact, he is the individual, and I'm being very careful to say this. Um, he needs to learn that that is not socially acceptable behavior. That is not proper behavior to indulge in. That breaking into other people's systems without their permission is, is something that is wrong. And until that's made clear, uh, we don't want to take a chance of having an individual like that back into the same kind of situation where they could do it again. Revenge is perhaps something that individuals would like to have. And in some societies, that's an accepted part of punishment. But at least in our society, revenge is, is not part of the philosophy of the legal system. Uh, the Constitution explicitly prohibits cruel and unusual punishment uh, to, in effect, say, no, you can't do things in revenge. That's not one of the purposes of punishment. Problems to resolve, though, uh, who has jurisdiction over something like this? If, if the WORM program was very careful to avoid all government computers, who would have jurisdiction? Because the federal law that's currently being uh, investigated to uh, charge the perpetrator uh, simply states that anyone who uh, accesses or denies service to a government-owned computer. So if all the attacks were to uh, Belcor and Bell Labs and Purdue University and Berkeley, um, who would have jurisdiction? <clears throat> How would you identify the guilty party? I'm not going to suggest this. Uh, in, well, I can suggest this as a defense in this case, uh, or any case, which is simply one of, uh, somebody broke into my account. I didn't do it. The system administrator used root privileges to send it off from my account. I didn't do it. I haven't logged in in weeks. I don't know who's been using it. They must have guessed my password. This has been used as a defense in an awful lot of things. And it gets back to verifying who it is who's actually doing something on your system. If the total verification you have is a login ID and a password, you can't prove anything. It's all circumstantial. Same thing with proving the activity. If all you've got is a log, an electronic log at that, you don't even have something hard copy that can't be changed, that's dated, uh, that shows that the commands were run, how can you prove anything? I was framed. My sysadmin went in and altered the file. I've done that to sysadmins, by the way. Um, Nothing criminal, but uh, I have done some interesting things <clears throat> before, I, before I learn better. Um, how do we convey the technological subtleties to a judge and jury? How do you explain to them what's involved with writing a program like this or goes across a network and make them understand? Uh, there, have been, there have been instances where trials have been heard and judges have been, have been heard to explain to the attorneys, said, well, I wasn't sure what you were talking about, but my grandson showed me his Apple computer and explained the whole thing to me and I'm ready. That's really frightening. And what's appropriate for punishment? Do we want to take somebody who knows how to break in to computers all across the country, put this guy in jail with embezzlers and murders, and thieves, and lawyers, even worse. <laughs> and uh, of course, we've got state-funded computer training classes for all these people and the computers there. Do you, know how many, do you know how many criminal mail fraud scams originate from inside prison? Can't wait to see the first computer-generated one. A third method of helping ensure our security in the computer realm has to do with influencing society. And I have here, we need to uh, really influence and develop an appropriate set of ethics and mores uh, for society. That is society in general and our society. That is as computer professionals. 
<clears throat> three parts here that I think are important. First of all, we need to generate a better respect for intellectual property. And I've got another slide on that in a moment. We need to share a professional approach to this. We shouldn't have some people saying, oh, this guy's a hero, and other people going, oh, this is criminal, and other people, he did us a favor, and others saying he should be strung up by something. Uh, that kind of diverse attitude is in some sense healthy. We don't, want to, we don't want to discourage people from having separate ideas, but as a profession, we need to come up with a consistent viewpoint towards this activity. And my argument here is, if we say that this is appropriate behavior, if we have 20 more break-ins over the next three weeks and you can't get any work done at all, those must be appropriate behavior too. You know, if they don't deny you access to your machine and they point out new security flaws, geez, we ought to thank those guys. Right. And we need to educate the public. They need to be made more aware of the problems involved and exactly that this is a serious crime against property, intellectual property. Something we've had difficulty with as a society, as a whole society, uh, for a long time. The Constitution gives Congress the right to establish copyrights and patents. It wasn't until the 1920s that the Copyright Act was really cleaned up so it made some sense. And it still doesn't apply very well to computer software and, and computer uh, electronically coded property. But it is. It's real property. It's something people spend time and money and effort to develop and to keep. It's a major part of, in some senses, your income. Uh, the programs that you develop, the data that you develop, is property. And just because you can't see it and hold it, uh, unless you get a printout, doesn't mean it's any less real. It's there and it's costly. It's worth time and money. It may control finances. It may control lives in some cases. People's lives may depend upon the pro proper operation of their computers. Somebody breaks into a computer used by an architectural firm or an engineering firm, and just for the fun of it, they change a couple constant values to see what'll happen. And nothing happens, so they forget about it. And a year and a half later, some bridge collapses when enough cars are on it. Or a nuclear power plant containment uh, vessel caves in and releases radioactivity. Uh, those are not all that far-fetched. Or air traffic control systems suddenly fla flash up uh, some kind of a message going, ha ha, April Fools. It certainly would be, yep. Intellectual property should be protected like any other property by law and custom. Not simply by law, but by law and custom. We should all recognize the value of intellectual property. We should respect it. We should encourage others to respect it. And of course, there are the concerns of privacy. That as property, it shouldn't be something that just anybody can look at or anybody can, can see. As professionals, well, these are things that should be known. These are, these are in effect derived from professional codes of ethics from ACM, IEEE, DPMA. If you belong to any of those, your society has a code of ethics that you're expected to adhere to that follow these same kind of things. You don't condone dishonesty. You don't condone the fact that you're uh, people you work with are making copies of software on diskettes simply because they don't want to pay for it. Now, I, I'm not saying that's something that happens here, but it happens a lot in academic environments. It happens a lot of other places. That shouldn't be something you condone because that's theft. You should respect data privacy. Just because you can read somebody's files doesn't mean you should. Uh, just because you can walk into their office and read the papers on their desk doesn't mean you should. Uh, support other professionals in their attempts to help educate the public, to help develop these laws. It's in some sense incumbent upon you as professionals who understand the problems to help educate the public, help educate your peers. And you should always do risk evaluation. When you're developing a system, think about what does it mean if this data is compromised. Think about what does it mean if people have access to this. One thing that I heard uh, that I wanted to mention too is security's gotten to be very, very hot topic right now. A lot of people are interested in it. The Internet Worm program, I'm aware of at least a dozen copies now where people have reverse engineered it. They've got C code. They're looking at it. They're playing with it. Uh, a lot of other places are beginning to look at these kind of programs. Uh, I heard just recently Fred Cohen, the, the fellow who developed uh, the virus program, was at the University of Cincinnati for a long time. He was developing virus programs on the campus computer that was hooked up to the Internet which is a real safe thing to do. Um, those of us who uh, may get an inclination to play with uh,
to play with these programs should realize it isn't without risk. Even though you think you're wearing one of the white hats, that doesn't mean that, that you should play with this. As, uh, as noted here, uh-oh, uh, we can run ourselves into all kinds of problems by incautious use of this. And that is the set of my slides. Are there any questions? Could you use the mic? If I could inconvenience you? This is so the people at the other locations can hear these embarrassing There's another questions. bad problem I see with your suggestions, a lot of which suggest that system administrators should have a great deal of power to monitor and survey everything that's going on on their machine. And that starts to run into conflict with the expectations of privacy of the people using the machine. And in fact, we have no agreed on ethic in the computer community about what the expectations of privacy are of somebody using a computer via their employment or studentship in a university. And I don't know if you have any feelings about what the rules ought to be on that. What the rules ought to be. Well, I agree that there's a problem. And in effect, you're exchanging one kind of trust for another. In one environment, you're trusting everybody not to look at the files you have. And a system administrator, in that sense, does not have any power or doesn't have to exercise it. Uh, right now, system administrators have the, have the ability to look at your files if they want to. Uh, the question you asked is, when I'm talking about greater security, in effect, we're asking them to look at them, not, not simply giving them the ability to. Having administered a number of computer systems and had to work with them in a university environment, uh, I can say that that's very boring. It, it really is. That uh, the kinds of things that people keep on their accounts may seem interesting. <clears throat> but with all the other kind of problems, it's not something that, that I felt any need or, or any motivation to do. And a lot of other people I've talked to who administer systems feel that same way. Not everybody does. There are the certain personality types who have to know everything about what's going on. Uh, that should be a factor in considering them for the job. I haven't answered your question. I'm not sure I can answer your question. Uh, that's one of the things that we need to resolve as a profession. We need to decide what is an appropriate expectation of privacy for using a system. Maybe that's part of an employment agreement. Maybe that's part of a shared professional concern, um, whatever. But we do need to come up to an agreed upon uh, ideal as to, as to how these systems should be used and whether or not it, uh, it's ethical to, to observe the behavior. Um, that's really the best answer I can give you right now. Could, could someone? Can I ask a question from here? I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it. I'll repeat it. Uh, of the three mechanisms used by uh, the virus program, it seems to me that in some sense the hardest to fix is the guessing of passwords. Do you have any sense of how far the program would have spread if it had used only that mechanism to penetrate other systems? Okay. Uh, the question for those who are at the remote sites was that the, uh, the WORM program really used three methods of, of getting to other systems, uh, one of which was guessing passwords. If, <laughs> if, it had been, uh, uh, if that had been the only mechanism used, how far would it have gotten? Uh, the answer is pretty far. People are, are very bad about picking passwords. And the choices it used um, in, its, in its various levels of guessing resulted in a number of hits uh, on our campus, on machines where the faculty are fairly well aware of the problems. It managed to, uh, I used the same mechanism it did. In 10 minutes, I found 10, 10 accounts that I could crack. And once it cracked into those accounts, using the remote host facilities that were available, I was able to reach no less than 20 machines directly. Um, I don't know about internally here at a location such as this, but um, when I'm talking about faculty using the machine, I think that's a fairly representative sample. If it had been a better chosen dictionary, it would have been an even higher percentage. People I've talked to at other sites seem to have gotten about the same percentages, that somewhere between 5 and 30 percent of, of accounts 
uh, could have been done. And all you need is one account that would get you to another five or ten machines, and then so on from there. Stu? Do you actually see any realistic hope for the code of ethics uh, type of approach? I'll point out that the Cornell Computer Science Department had an explicit code of ethics forbidding this activity of all students. It was explicit and given to all students. Yeah, one of the, one of the things that was pointed out Oh, the, the, repeat the question, is uh, do I see any hope for, for a code of ethics that the Cornell Computer Science Department had an explicit code of ethics for students that uh, didn't seem to help in this case if, in fact, that, uh, Robert Morris was, was the individual. Uh, in fact, if he was the individual, when he was an undergraduate at Harvard, there was a required course in ethics required of, of all the undergraduate students, which uh, apparently he was able to bypass somehow, <laughs> um, which I think is, is kind of interesting. Um, actually, I, I, yeah, <laughs> advanced placement. Uh, I, kn I, I actually know how it happened, and I'm, I'm not at liberty to say, but uh, I do not think that a code of ethics is a solution by itself. It's not going to make an incredible difference. However, if, again, using Robert Morris as, as an example, there is evidence that these kinds of, of activities that he, he engaged in occurred um, before he was hired as, a, as, a, as an intern at Bell Labs. They happened while he was at Harvard. They happened at CMU. They happened at MIT. They happened a number of places. And everybody involved, all the other professionals that were associated with him kind of said, don't do that. That was it. As a profession, if we develop a code of ethics to say that's wrong, that's behavior we will not tolerate, and make that explicit and clear, we create an environment where it is, it is costly in the sense of social pressure to engage in such behavior. We have to convey to someone that this is not appropriate behavior for, for a professional. Now it's a difficult thing because in our profession, uh, many of us, 5, 10, 15 years ago, when computer science was, it's still very young, but as a developing field, to demonstrate to someone that we really had some expertise, that we really knew something about the insides of a system and how it worked, we would break into the system a couple times and we'd show them that we knew how to do it. We know how to take advantage of the memory mechanism and the file system to gain privilege. And great, that's how some of us got started. That's how maybe we got our jobs. But the field, the discipline, has matured and evolved considerably since then. Now, if you're going to look at someone and say, that's a professional, that's someone I'd like to hire, they have to be able to do a lot more than break into a system or take advantage of a virtual memory mechanism. They have to know how to design a program and how to test it. They need to be able to talk about algorithms and AI. Uh, they have to know something about data structures. And we no longer have to prove ourselves in, in the sense of breaking into a system. We can't cling to that kind of tolerance to say, oh, geez, they're sharp, or that's something that we're going, we're going to encourage. So it's a very long answer to a short question. Uh, yes, I think it can help. I don't think it's a solution, and I don't think it can stand on its own. But I think it's an important thing that we need to do as a, as a group of professionals. Is that? I'm just curious because the Cornell Department had an explicit prohibition in its code of ethics. <coughs> um, it was a prohibition, but I'm not sure that the people in that environment really, really, uh, really held to it and really felt that it was important. In fact, the faculty can't agree to enforce it. Yeah, if the, if the, faculty, if the faculty involved, uh, we have that problem at Purdue. What happens if you catch a bunch of students che cheating on an assignment? It ranges anywhere from giving you a zero on the assignment to expelling them from the university. It's not agreed upon. Some professors say, well, we'll give them a second chance or a third chance. Everybody's entitled to a mistake. And others go, it's unprofessional. It's not the way they should behave. They fail my course. Uh, we can't even agree on that. So. Uh, excuse me. Let's give the other lo locations a chance to ask questions. Okay. Do we have any questions? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, let's see, Piscataway and uh, Navasink. Maybe they're not there. <laughs> Maybe they left. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Is there any hope for Unix? <laughs> <laughs> is there any hope for Unix? I'm sure there is. Uh, first of all, let me state that. People are placing great hope on the idea of uh, the certified versions of, of Unix, the B2 and, and B3 versions of Unix that everybody's working on. All that states is that if you have users working on the same machine, 
you have a certain amount of trust, a certain amount of confidence that they aren't going to exchange data. They aren't going to see each other's data. It doesn't say anything about people breaking in from outside. Uh, a couple of people at Bell Labs did an analysis of the worm program, and it would have broken into, their, into a commonly accepted uh, B2 secure system. Um, so in that sense, I, I don't know about hope. Uh, I think there's more hope for Unix than there is for MS-DOS. <laughs> it's a matter of where are we going to use it. We, shouldn't, we probably shouldn't be using Unix in its current uh, form to be storing critical medical records or critical financial records. If Bank of America was to be using Unix to do all their online processing of their bank account records, I'd be pretty worried. Um, Unless it was, it was just a standalone machine that they kept in a guarded room and there you know, was no connection with the outside world, I might feel a little bit better about it. Uh, Unix was not designed to be a, a general purpose, worldwide shared system and secure at the same time. The whole philosophy of building the system was to enhance sharing and enhance the capability to reconfigure and for people to do things. Uh, it was not designed to try and keep out determined vandals. And we can redesign Unix with an eye towards all of those things that I had mentioned to try and keep those people out, but then it's not really Unix anymore. It's a different operating system. Uh, maybe we need to strike a balance in the middle. So uh, saying, is there hope for Unix? Well, it depends on how you want to define what Unix is going to be. And uh, in that sense, yes. I think it's going to be here for a long time. I'm told that Livingston is also part of this conference. So uh, do we have questions from Livingston? No question at Livingston. <laughs> There's life in the universe. Well, let's, let's try Piscataway again. Any questions? Uh, Navasek? OK. There was, there was one. You have a question. Go ahead. I had a question. I've heard some people suggest that uh, you don't need all this human behavior changing uh, ethics and all that, that you can solve the problem through better security on hardware and software, forcing people to change their passwords, not accepting plain English passwords. That's just the beginning. Uh, make it a much more expensive system to use, but a much more secure one, and not rely on, on trust and all this uh, squishy stuff. Do you see any hope for a technological fix? Okay. The, the question was asked, um, it has been claimed that by sufficient application of technology, throwing enough resources at it, we can make a secure system without behavioral changes. We don't need to have an influence on the individuals using the systems. We just simply have to make them more secure. Um, is that, in fact, a possibility that, that a technological fix is there and we don't have to depend upon such, I love that word, squishy uh, approaches? I don't think so. Um, Again, true security in, in the sense of not allowing any, any kind of, of damage to occur or any kind of unwarranted access is impossible in any system. Uh, it, it just simply can't be done because um, anybody who thinks up a security system is effectively only human, or at least I assume most of us are. And uh, therefore, other people with sufficient application of time, resources, and creativity can defeat those very same systems. Military secure, uh, security systems, be they fences around buildings or, or uh, identity cards, have been and continue to be compromised now and then. Bank vaults, you lock something up in a safe deposit box, somebody with a sufficient application of creativity and dedication can go in and steal right out of the vault. Uh, so in that sense, we can make it very, very expensive and very difficult for somebody to compromise the system. But if we don't change some of the attitudes, it's going to become a game for people to try and defeat it. We don't need a game where everybody's trying to break into the system. What we'd like to do is make it so that one or two sociopaths <laughs> want to get into the system, and we make it difficult for them to do so. So um, the answer is, no matter what we do, we can't secure the system. I think we stand a much better chance by taking a multifaceted approach. Yes. Gene, do you know anything about um, the, uh, the progress of uh, trying to find out uh, or trying to determine legally 
whether uh, Robert Morris was indeed the perp, and uh, you know, are, is the grand jury about to hand down an indictment? I mean, what do we? What's known? Uh, according to the FBI source that I talked to, uh, <laughs> if there was a grand jury meeting, uh, they would be meeting in Syracuse and they would be close to handing down an indictment. That was the best he was able to tell me. Other sources inform me that yes, indeed, they've been called before a grand jury. So you can sort of draw a conclusion from, from that combination of statements. Uh, from the things that I am aware of that, that I, have, I have stated and that others have stated, there is a fairly convincing case that it was indeed at least Robert Morris Jr. or Robert T. Morris who was involved in this. It is not clear whether or not anybody assisted him con uh, directly or indirectly with this. Uh, I certainly would not, not care to state that, that he is, he is the, the one or that he is, he is obviously guilty of this, but there certainly seems to be an awful lot of evidence in that direction. Uh, that is something that will have to be decided uh, by the court uh, should indictments come down. But to the best of my knowledge, the rumors do seem to indicate that that is, that is the case and that indictments are probably going to be handed down within the next week or two. When I found out about the Sun Mail bug, I was kind of flabbergasted by the size of it. Uh, do you think uh, a company like Sun, say, making money selling this code has to share some of the liability for the Internet worm? <clears throat> when you say liability, do you mean moral or legal? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay. Moral responsibility, to a certain extent, yes. Uh, they provided that software. They have, in some senses, implied that the system can be used out of the box and in a safe manner. From a legal standpoint, no, not at all. Uh, the licenses that they have people sign indicate that the software is provided as is. You accept it at your own risk. Uh, tough luck, buddy. And they're not the only one. I mean, anybody else selling software does the same thing. Uh, that's probably another front that we need to, to all work against is not to accept those kind of clauses and contracts. We may find it much more difficult to get <coughs> software. But uh, <clears throat> so from the liability standpoint, well, yes, there, there, is some, there is some moral responsibility on their part. That, that they, they accepted that. They put that in. Uh, whether or not they tested it is, is an open question. Uh, but then again, they're working in the same kind of environment that all of, we are, that, uh, that all of us are, that uh, all their machines in-house, it's a trusted network. I mean, it's like right in, right in here. If you were to package that stuff up and send it out, that's the way you use it here, and you've never had any problems. So I think they're going to be a lot more aware from here on in. Uh, there's, there's little doubt of that. But, but Sun generally calls themselves as a, as a desktop computer company. They're not a software company. Well, this may, this may just reinforce that. Uh, you made quite a few comments about the insecurity of Unix. Can you tell us any commercial operating system that you think is significantly more secure than Unix? Well, um, I think if you've got a Macintosh locked up in your office, that's a fairly secure operating system. Um, nobody can get to it. Uh, in terms of having security features, again, I, d I don't think there's any, any system that I would really consider to be... Um, multics. Well, Multics. Uh, yeah, uh, pick, pick any one of the operating systems that isn't run anymore. <laughs> I, I really don't think there are, uh, I think the systems are, are in some senses equally secure in, in the way that they're used and, and the way they are. I'm not, I'm not going to recommend an operating system, in other words. I, I don't think any of them really set a good example for that. I think an awful lot of computer companies, unless they're marketing it with some sense to be a secure operating system, don't give it a lot of effort. That's a problem all of us have, is when we design programs, we don't think about security up front. And, uh, and I'm not familiar with a broad range of them either, so I would, I would hesitate to, to point some of them out. Well, just one more, and then uh, I think we better stop. Consider the amount of, uh, of interest and understanding of security that's come out of this Internet incident. Uh, do you care to comment on whether you think it's been more beneficial or more harmful? Uh, as a oh, whether, whether the pu I've been asked whether, with all the publicity, whether this has been beneficial or harmful. Uh, 
it's been beneficial in a, in a number of ways and harmful in some others, uh, which is a nice answer, right, uh, if I stop there. Um, it's been beneficial in that it's raised a lot of consciousness. I don't think that this talk would have attracted this many people had something like this not happened. Uh, and I think all of you, now when you put files on the computer or when you build programs, if you stop even for a second or two and think about the implications involved of why am I putting that data on? Why am I sending this via mail? Why, why do I have my system, my door unlocked with my system sitting there? Uh, then maybe that's done some good. And that's uh, country, nationwide that's happening. It's going to cause a lot of computer companies to think a little bit more on how they go about instituting security in their systems and testing the software. It's going to make a difference on university campuses. Instead of pushing software off until the last half of the last lecture because we didn't get to it and there's, there's only five pages in the chapter in the textbook, maybe they'll start introducing some of that early on like they should. Uh, anyhow, it's, it's a design principle. It's not something you add on afterwards. The downside of this is the image the public has of our computer systems, their quality and what they do, has been hurt. There's been some incredibly shoddy reporting. You know, people going, oh, we were close to war games, World War III. Oh, sure. Uh, when I answered, uh, I've been talking to the press, trying, many members of the press, trying to give them a, a, as accurate a picture of this as I could. One of the first phone calls I got was from, from someone at a local Indiana paper who kind of said, do, you, do your students need to worry about catching this virus? <laughs> There's so much of that out there that, that the kind of image that, that people have gotten of our computers and our network uh, has in some sense been damaged. Even worse are the people in legislative uh, bodies who have looked at this and said, well, you know, maybe we need to regulate. That's just what we need is more, more government interference in this area. Uh, the, uh, there are two committees in the House of Representatives who are going to be holding hearings uh, this next term on this whole incident. Uh, and I have some, some fears as to what kinds of things they may come up with. So in that sense, I think it's hurt. The fact that it started some of the discussions it has, just as I indicated, we need to talk about a shared sense of privacy, a shared sense of ethics. What are we going to do? I think that can only be beneficial in the long run. I just wish we hadn't learned it quite this way. Got it? Thank you, James. Well, thank you very much.